Well, good morning, church family. Uh, as Danny mentioned, uh, this is my last Sunday here at Shades uh, before my wife and I and a team uh, from our church are sent out to begin the process of planting a church at UAB. Or at least that's what I tell people. Uh, the real reason this is my last Sunday at Shades is actually because I, uh, I just feel like my, my purpose has been uh, served here. My mission is complete to be the missing link in an evolutionary chain of Chad. <laughs> I always thought I was special because I was like the one who looked like Chad and then I realized Riggs Taylor got hired here at Shades, is not here today? And as soon as Riggs got hired, I just this whisper in my heart came up and just said, you're, you're done, your time's up. You're, you're, you're now obsolete. There we go. We're like even wearing the same shirt and then, and then you get Chad, the final form. Um, so that's, that's, that's the real reason. Um, so, you know, we, everybody loves a little self-deprecation. That's fun. It's funny. But what we don't like is, is the opposite. We don't like self-importance. Nobody likes somebody who brags. Um, there's lots of different forms of bragging, but one of my favorite forms of bragging is one-upping. And one of my favorite one-ups that I've ever heard was when I was in third grade, there was, uh, there was this kid who any time uh, some other kid would bring up their dad and like what he did for a living or just anything about his dad, he would just cut him off mid-sentence. And he would say, oh yeah? Well, my dad owns the army. And he lets me drive his tank on the streets. And we're like in third grade, I'm like having two thoughts. I'm like, okay, there's a guy who owns the army and but also, like, there's no way that that's true. But any, every time he said it, he always won. That was the one up that just like, well, yeah, my, it doesn't matter what else your dad does. He doesn't own the army. So uh, there you go. But, you know, you won't find bragging or, or self-importance in uh, how to win friends and influence people. Because it's, it just it kind of smells. It stinks. We know it's not right. We kind of resist it because the reality is, is nobody's more important than the, ne than the next person. And when I walk into a room and I think I'm the most important person in there, um, I don't typically get welcomed with open arms. You get resisted a bit. And so we know that's true with, with our human relationships, but we just can't seem to grasp that it, that's the same with God. There's something inside of us that, that tells us that, um, okay, yeah, like, other people don't like when I brag. I don't like when other people brag and all that. And I'm, when I'm the most important person in the room. But I, th I think that God likes that. I think that God, I think God wants me to show off. I think God wants me to, to be important for him. I think he wants me to, to live a life that I can, when I, when I die, I can point back and say, look, look at this. This is, this is something that I, you should be impressed with. This is, this is why you should love me. This is why you should like me. This is why I should be in your family. And yet we hear this refrain throughout scripture over and over and over again that God gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So as we enter a new year when personal resolve is at an all-time high, uh, I want to direct our hearts this morning to Luke 18, where Jesus tells a parable about a tax collector and a Pharisee. And in this parable, Jesus invites us not to brag, but to beg. Jesus invites us to beg. And so th as we look at this uh, this parable in Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. We're going to look at it in three sections. First, what we think God wants. Second, what God actually wants. And then third, how in the world do we get there? 
So let's begin by reading this passage together. Uh, like I mentioned, it's Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. If you want to just go ahead and stand as we read God's word, as we hear it read. So I'm going to read this whole passage for us, and then we will, we will walk through it. So Luke 18, beginning in verse 9, says this. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. So we first want to look at the mistake of what we think God wants. And we see that with the Pharisee in this parable. And Jesus actually tells us in verse 9 his specific audience for this parable. He says that he told this to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. And then he goes on to illustrate that with the Pharisee. And what we see with the Pharisee is he does, he does two things, and it illustrates the two same things that every single one of us does as well. In order to build a case to persuade ourselves and to persuade God that, yeah, like, you, you should like me, you should love me, we do two things. One, we make ourselves look better than we actually are. And two, we make others look worse than they actually are. So the first thing that we do in making ourselves look better than we actually are, we see this in the second half of the Pharisee's prayer in verse 12, he says, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. That's pretty good. I mean, if you think about it, fasting twice a week, I mean, fasting twice in a lifetime is something worth, that's something worth mentioning, right? That you, but twice a week, every Monday and Wednesday, you're refraining from food so you can pray. I mean, I don't do that. I don't know if you do, but that's, that's pretty good. He gives tithes of all that he gets, not just his Regular income, but his loans, his credit cards, everything. He's, he's tithing on everything. And yet he's, he's missed it. The, 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 the parable, as we heard just a minute ago, read, it doesn't resolve with him going home justified. He goes home unjustified. He, he goes home unrighteous. And what we see here with the Pharisee and making himself look better than he actually is, he is doing something that the enemy tempts every single one of us to do, specifically those of us who are regularly in church, to use religion as a fig leaf, to use Christianity, to use churchy stuff as a fig leaf, as something to hide our real true selves from God. And think that if we can hide the real true me with a bunch of Christian-y religious stuff, then maybe, just maybe, He'll be good with me. He'll, he'll like me. There was um, a, a, a popular Christian author, speaker, person whose name I will not mention because it's not important, but I had the opportunity uh, to meet this guy, and we had a conversation, and I was surprised by what he wanted to talk about in our conversation. Uh, I say conversation, it was more of he was just kind of talking at me about all these accomplishments that he had, he had done, and the thing he was most proud about was his Twitter feed. So he wanted to tell me all about his Twitter. So not just how many followers he had or what. He wanted to tell me specific details about his impressions on Twitter. So not only how many average likes he gets or retweets, but from those people who like and retweet his stuff, how many people just view his tweets, even if they don't interact with it. And so he gave me like this whole spiel about his Twitter and 
at the end of it, I was just, and he, there was other things he mentioned as well, as he was kind of just building this case of why God probably liked him quite a bit. I mean, he, he, he tweets twice a day about the Bible and the gospel. I mean, these really great tweets. I mean, I'm going to be, I liked his Twitter um, up until that point. And, but what, I mean, it was so clear to me, this, this guy he has been, he's been tricked by the enemy, and he's using the gospel as a fig leaf. He's using that as a bragging right of, look how, look how great I am, and that I do all this good on, on Twitter for people and, you know, encouraging them and all that. So let me ask you this. How, how are you tempted to, to use Christianity as a fig leaf? Maybe you're, maybe you're a truth person who's, who's all about the Word of God, right doctrine, as we should be. Been teaching Sunday school for a long time. That's great. We, we should do those things. But there's a difference between being a truth person who stands on the Word of God and being a truth person who stands on the Word of God and says, this is why I'm righteous. This, this is why God likes me. Or maybe, on the other hand, you're, you're a grace person. So yeah, you like the Bible, good with all, like that's great, but you're about living it out. You, you, you're compassionate. You, you do social justice all the time, and that's good, and we should. That is near to the heart of God that we should live that out. But there's a difference between living that out and saying, this is why I'm righteous. It's, it's, a, it's a tricky trick of the enemy to avert our attention from Jesus onto ourselves and trust in ourselves. Now, that's the first way. We make ourselves look better than we actually are. But the second thing that we do is we make others look worse than they actually are. And this is incredibly efficient. Like, if you don't have time to, uh, to do a bunch of stuff that makes you look better, just, just point the finger at somebody else and just point out the glaring mess in, you know, in their life. And that's what we see Jesus call out here with the Pharisees as well. He says, not only do, 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 are those that he's speaking to trusting in themselves that they're righteous, but they're also treating others with contempt. So treating others with contempt is a really serious thing. That word contempt there is the same word that was used of Herod and his soldiers when they were mocking and flogging and getting ready to murder Jesus. They, the idea of treating someone with contempt is that we, we treat them as non-existent to the point that we wish they were non-existent or even make them non-existent, which is what happened with Jesus. They pushed him right out of the world. It's an evil, murderous thing, but... That is what trusting in yourself requires you to do. It requires you to do that because it's not enough just to, to do things that make you look good. You have to make everybody else look bad. And so we have to like stack the bodies and stand on top and wave so we can get God's attention. Like, hey, look at me. The Pharisee does this in verse 11. This is actually how he starts his prayer. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. I mean, this is, this is, this is passive-aggressive prayer, passive-aggressive praise. He's not thanking God for anything. He's thanking himself. And he lists off this, these groups of people that he's not like, extortioners, the unjust, adulterers. What's he doing? He's, he's just cherry-picking sins that he doesn't struggle with. Just three things he doesn't struggle with, that he's not done, that he's not guilty of, and he's calling it out in others. We can do the same thing. But then it gets, he takes it a, a level deeper. It gets personal. It's no longer 30,000 feet. It's, it's 10 feet away when he says, or even like this tax collector. This sleazeball guy who has no right to be near your temple. God, I thank you that I'm not like him. You can just see him pointing his finger at him. That's where trusting in ourselves takes us. It takes us to not loving our neighbor, 
but hating our neighbor, being unloving towards our neighbor. So what, what you and I have to pay attention to is when in our hearts, when we, when we hear about or see or think of groups of people that we think that we're better than, when we have that quiet whisper in our heart of like, dear Lord, I just thank you that I'm not like them. Or on that next level, when it's, when it's a person who you can, who's in your life, who you know, who's in your workplace, or in our church, or in, in, your, in your home, someone that you were around over Christmas, that you can, look, you can point at and say, God, I thank you that I'm not like this person. Because those people are not people to be despised or treated with contempt. Those are actually people that have much to teach us about the grace of God. Because the grace of God can't be beat. It can't be out sinned. Those people are also eligible for God's grace as well. And you and I need it just as much as them. So putting all of us together, looking at the Pharisee, trusting in ourselves that we're righteous, sounds like this. I deserve God's love because I'm not like that person. And that's not, that's not the way I want to live, and yet I do it. That's not the way that we want to live. That's not, what, that's not what we actually really think real Christianity is about. But our hearts lead us in that place because we don't fully trust the finished work of Jesus. And so we think, I've got to compensate a little bit. Now, this leads us to our, our second section of, of what God actually wants. So if he doesn't want us to brag, what does he want? He wants us to beg. He wants us to be desperate, really, is what we see with the tax collector. Like I mentioned a second ago, tax collectors were, were notorious sinners. They were like the lowest of the low. They're always like, they're, they're, they're the punching bag in the Gospels for just like, the messed up of the messed up, most likely because they would exploit their position for their own profit. But when we see the tax collector in verse 13, he won't even get close to the temple. He's, we don't know what's brought him there, but something has clicked for him, and he knows he's broken. He knows that he's not okay. He knows that he has sin to confess. He knows that he's at the end of himself, and so he goes, or he won't even, he won't even lift up his his eyes to heaven to pray. He's just, I mean, you can just imagine, his head is just hanging low, and he's just beating his chest. And his prayer is seven words compared to the 33 words of the, the Pharisee, who is just one long brag. He didn't even ask for anything. He just was showing off. And then here you get the, you get the tax collector who just says seven words. God, be merciful to me a sinner. He's not looking at the Pharisees, he's not looking at anybody else, he's just looking at himself, and he's empty, and he's desperate. It's like he's in an ocean of his own sin, and he's drowning, and he's just trying to keep his head above water, and all he can get out is help. His prayer for God to be merciful to him, a sinner, it's a really audacious thing to pray. Um, when he's asking for God to be merciful, he's not simply asking for God just to be nice to him, to forgive and forget, like act like nothing ever happened. He is asking God, he is, he's telling God, make atonement for me. Make me right. Fix me. Make me clean. Make me new. Make me innocent because I've got nothing. I've got nothing and if you don't show up and fix me and heal me, then I'm done. I'm going to drown. So he's empty of himself. Well, the Pharisee was full of himself. He's, he's trusting in Jesus. In that prayer, he is trusting in Jesus. While in the Pharisee's prayer, he's just trusting in himself. So how do we see that? in ourselves. How do you see that in yourself? I think it's worth mentioning that in the, the greater context of Luke 18, we see this pattern unfold that God, that Jesus associates with desperate people. You, you see Jesus list out the, almost like the model disciples. He, he's, 
in Luke 18. He starts with a widow, and then it's children, and then it's this guy, the, the, the broken tax collector, and then he closes with a blind homeless guy. All those are people that, they're his people. They're in. And what do they have in common? They're dependent. They, act, they need Jesus. They need him desperately. But then you, we also see that Jesus lays out two models of anti-disciples. We've got the rich young ruler, which is what every single one of us wants to be, rich, young, and powerful. And then the Pharisee, a religious leader. And, and those are the two guys that get resisted. Those are the two guys that Jesus does not associate with. He has nothing to do with them. He's, re, he's, he, he's repulsed by them because they don't need him. They're independent. Now, this leads us to our final, our final section of how in the world do we get there? Because we know, like, bragging is not the way. We want, we want to do what Jesus is, is opening the door for us to do. But how do we get there? Because if I'm honest with myself, I don't want to. I don't want to humble myself. I don't want to say, I need help. I don't even want to go to the doctor for crying out loud. Like, I don't want to even say, like, hey, my, something hurts. I can't fix it. I need you to, to help. I'm mean, like, I've got this toothache that took me, like, way too long to go into the dentist. And I finally went in, and they, you know, they told me, hey, you need a root canal. So I've got that lined up. But I kid you not, for like a split, like a split second, but not even a second, I thought, I've got some pliers at home. Could probably take care of it myself. And I was like, no, what are you talking about? No, you're crazy. No, just go, just lay down your pride. Go let somebody help you. Because which, which of the two ways do we get well? Is it when we, we go out to the garage, get the pliers, and just try and do work on our souls? Or is it when we just get honest with ourselves, when we get honest with the Lord and we just say, I'm tired, I'm, I'm done trying to pretend, and I just need you to come through for me. Well, this is how we get there. Um, we see it in, uh, in verse 14, as Jesus kind of pulls back and gives us the moral of the story. He says, I tell you, this man, the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So how do we humble ourselves? How do we, how do, we do that? Because here's the reality. We can't do it in our own strength. Paul tells us in Philippians 2 that Jesus emptied himself and humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. In, in Corinthians, Paul tells us that the love of Christ compels us. The way that we begin a journey, a journey of humbling ourselves is by looking at Jesus on the cross. Because when we look at Jesus on the cross, we get a clear and true and accurate picture of ourselves that my sin put Jesus there, not that person's sin, my sin put him there. And we get a clear and accurate and honest picture of the heart of God that he would give up, he would give himself he would give up his one and only begotten son to take my place. This is amazing. This is incredible. All of a sudden, I can start to loosen up. I can start to let all the, the, the pretending, the performing unravel a little bit and allow the Lord to begin meeting me and taking me even lower. The good news of Jesus means the exact opposite of what we've attributed this, this fake Bible verse. That, that fake verse is not in the Bible of God helps those who help themselves. That's, that is the exact opposite of the gospel. It's not in the Bible. The gospel is that God cannot help those who help themselves. Those are the only people he can't help. And he only helps those who cannot help themselves. So the invitation for all of us this morning is to get desperate before the Lord. And you're, you might be in one of two places. You might be here this morning thinking, 
Yes and amen. That is me. I'm drowning. I'm messed up. I know. I'm, I don't even. Things are bad. And so you need this. And so take it. It's, it's a free gift. It's yours. But you may be on the other side of the fence of saying, like, I, if I'm just honest with myself, and you ask me, what, what is a sin you have to confess? You would say, I don't know. I literally, I don't, I can't think of anything. Like, I, I truly cannot. Then what, what I invite you to do, in line with what the tax collector did, is to ask God to be merciful to you, a sinner, to show you a new place in your life, a new chamber in your heart that's still darkened, that still needs his grace, because we can get so we get, we get so stuck in a rut of resisting Jesus' grace by, by being religious that we can actually forget that we're sinners and that we need his grace. And every, nobody in here is perfect. Nobody in here is a finished product. So that, all, that means we all need what the tax collector needed for God to be merciful to me, a sinner. It's scary. It's uncomfortable. It's much much safer, much more comfortable to just build my own case before the Lord. But when we get low before the Lord, who meets us there? Jesus. Jesus meets us there in ever-increasing clarity and closeness, and he's there in all of his power and grace, and mercy, and where Jesus is, there's life, and there's life abundant, there's freedom, there's hope, joy, peace, all the things that we want. So the invitation for us this morning, and the promise is that the, that longing that we each have in our heart to be important, to be exalted, is not something that God is trying to repress. He's trying to give that to us, but he's trying to give that to us on his terms, not saying that I'm important because of me. He's, he wants to make you important because of Jesus. He wants to give you the importance of his son, of himself. And so we empty ourselves of saying, I, nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. So I want to invite everyone this morning to, to bow your heads and to close your eyes for just a second. And I just want to give space to just process, prayerfully process, whatever it is that the Lord might be speaking to you, doing to you uh, this morning in this moment. Whether it's you need, to, you need to just cry out for his mercy, where you need to cry out for him to show you that you need his mercy, you need to praise him for the fact that he's come through for you recently, whatever it is, I'm just going to give everybody a second to just do that, and then I will close us in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that you are gracious and compassionate and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. God, thank you that you offer that to us freely through Jesus. Help us to let go of our, of our righteousness so that we can re- receive the righteousness of Christ. So God, meet every single one of us in the place that we are. You know our hearts. You know our, our lives. You know where we're at. So God, um, meet us there provide for us. And God, we praise you for Christ. We praise you that he came to give himself up for us while we were yet sinners. Thank you for the promise to exalt us and to lift us up with Christ. We pray these things in his name. Amen.